Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. We'll just give a couple of seconds more for um, a number of um, uh, participants who are joining us, and then I'll kick it off. Very good. Let me uh, let me start. And uh, on behalf of the United Nations Development Program, uh, UNDP, my name is Kani Wignaraja, and I am the Regional Director for Asia Pacific. Um, and let me, on behalf of UNDP and our partners, the Mastercard Center for Inclusive Growth, and the Center for Public Impact, I am so pleased to welcome you to a series of three hour-long discussions this week. Uh, very much timed uh, on the eve of the 76th UN General Assembly. And this underpins what we call the equity imperative, which is a collaboration between these three institutions. Let me unpack this briefly. The themes of shared prosperity and sustainability embed the very notion of equity, both intra and intergenerational. As our UN Secretary General outlined, in his common agenda, which was issued last week and will be the underpinnings to frame the conversations at the General Assembly. We are at an inflection point in history, facing probably the biggest test since the Second World War. And that's not said lightly. Now we know COVID-19 is upending our world, exposing the breaks in our economies, our health systems uh, and our social contracts. It is true that we have made tremendous progress in the last 30 years, significantly reducing poverty and expanding human capabilities and freedoms. And this is so in um, countries even like Afghanistan, which is very much uh, in the center of the news these days. Now UNDP's flagship human development reports have documented these. We see incomes in developing countries have risen by more than 150%. Years of schooling have gone up by three and a half years with a huge increase in enrollment for girls. And this is also across a lot of tough crisis uh, situations. Average life expectancy has gone up by seven years. Now we're very proud of these as a, a total global development community, but we also know that these averages overlook the hundreds of millions of people for whom such um, basic progress uh, is overridden by basic human deprivations, discriminations, violence and inclusions. These are facts of life for them. So in this era of plenty, while proud of our unprecedented achievements, including in science and technology, we, that global, same global community, have also allowed the destruction of our climate and environment and this level of inequality and injustice to define the real politique. So we cannot stay back and sit back uh, and remain complacent. Because getting to a place of shared prosperity and peace, while also saving our planet, will need a global commitment to cooperation and solidarity. And we don't seem able to muster that as yet. It even seems harder to put actions and money behind it. So take the call by the UN for universal vaccination against COVID-19. This is no longer just a demand and supply issue alone but also one of renewing the social contract between government and people and between that international community and countries. So this is what we have built this partnership around. In a post pandemic world, and yes, I want to keep speaking to a post pandemic world, the equity imperative will infuse these quests to rebuild trust through better delivery of public services, upholding human rights and dignities, and expanding economic opportunities. These quests can no longer be presented as competing goals, 
or as inimical to our shared interests. In fact, quite the contrary. So together, UNDP, the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, and the Center for Public Impact will look to advance new ideas around redesigning economic systems whose success is measured in more whole ways, creating incentives to protect our planet and rebuilding social sol solidarity through trust in inclusive institutions. We are also pleased that some of the world's leading development thinkers will keynote each of our webinars. Today, we will have Professor Kaushik Basu who joins us from Cornell, former chief economist at the World Bank and chief economic advisor to the government of India. On Wednesday, we will be joined by Dr. Laura Tyson, former chair of the US President's Council of Economic Advisors and distinguished professor at the Haas School of Business at Berkeley. And for the third and final session this week, Professor Jeffrey Sachs will keynote from the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. You can tell we're very excited by having them with us and by this partnership. So I now turn to Michael Froman, Vice Chair and President of Strategic Growth at MasterCard, who is also a distinguished public servant having served as the US Trade Representative under President Obama. Thank you and over to you, Michael. Well, thank you very much, Connie, and thank you to your colleagues at UNDP and our friends at the Center for Public Impact. It's a great pleasure to be with you for this important event. When we look back over the last couple of years, it will go down in history as a time of, of great reckoning. Uh, the pandemic fundamentally upended all of our lives and laid bare our frayed social contract. But it also left us with a clear imperative. We can't just go back to where we were before because where we were before wasn't good enough. And so now begins the hard work of creating meaningful, lasting change with equity at its core. Uh, as Connie said, a vaccine will set us on the road to recovery, but a true recovery will take an unprecedented commitment from every sector and industry if we're gonna reimagine our economic system and society to be fair, just, and equitable. In short, we need to redefine what it means to achieve equitable and inclusive growth itself. Last year, the, our Center for Inclusive Growth uh, led a collaborative exercise in partnership with the Center for Public Impact to define what an inclusive economy looks like and what it takes to reimagine our economic models to address growing inequality and exclusion. We consulted dozens of economists, policymakers, social sector leaders, and business leaders from around the world. And the result is a new framework called Built for All, which aims to mobilize action across the public, private, and civic sectors to push for and monitor a set of broad actions leaders can take to drive change. We put forward a set of desirable outcomes of an inclusive economy and potential actions the public, private, and civic sectors can take to reimagine and rebuild economies within three major pillars. Equitable access to resources and opportunities, a level playing field for work and competition, and collective stewardship of shared resources for future generations. Over the next three days, we'll learn from some of the leading experts in these areas on how to start the important work of building this kind of new economy. For instance, we need to expand our measure of economic success. For years, we assumed that if the economy was growing and the gross domestic product was expanding, all was well. But we know that aggregate measures like GDP only capture the big picture and miss the lived experience for too many to get lost in the aggregate. We've got work to do to redesign some systems that reinforce and perpetuate inequity. For example, under the auspices of the Edison Alliance, the World Economic Forum and a number of others launched recently a shared set of principles for an inclusive financial system. The principles aim to redesign the financial system. So instead of working to include the excluded, we design a system that puts inclusion at its core from the start. And we'll hear tomorrow from Laura Tyson and other experts about the need to address the inequalities of opportunity and embed equity in every part of our economy. A fair playing field creates the means to achieve financial security, better quality jobs, and truly inclusive growth. 
And third, we should create incentives for long-term investment. Short-term thinking is no longer sustainable in the face of global and generational issues like climate change. A shift to long-term planning will require new incentives and a recognition that long-term value creation requires profitable solutions to the problems of people and the planet. And finally, it's critical to rebuild trust in institutions and communities so that inclusive recovery efforts could be co-created at the local level to ensure their long-term success. Trusted institutions can help bring all sectors together and build bridges. We hope this actionable framework with the background of the United Nations General Assembly can help set the stage for an important set of discussions throughout the week on how we can work together across sectors to build a more equitable and sustainable economy around the world. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Kaushik Basu, former chief economist of the World Bank and professor of international studies and economics at Cornell University. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Mike Truman, Gandhi Vigna Raja, um, and for those words and what I have to say, I hope will be pretty much along the same lines. Friends and members of the distinguished United Nations community, with the COVID-19 pandemic raging, conflict around the world, and the climate deterioration bearing down on us, this is a time of crisis for the entire global economy. But for that very reason, this is also the time to reimagine our economy, to build from scratch, so to say once again, to remind ourselves that the world is built for all to share, people across the world and people across generations, those of us who live now and those who will inherit the world that we leave behind. This is a time for a new global compact for us as human beings to stand together, to rebuild trust and hope. This is a time for a moral commitment, a small commitment from each one of us. But I give this lecture as an appeal to all, but especially to you who are associated with the United Nations in any capacity, anywhere in the world, and are so a bit more powerful to use your influence to build a better world and a more equitable world. I know as was said in the introductory remarks, that is what we are talking about. And when I was at the World Bank, I would spend a lot of time, not just on poverty eradication, which is of course the most important target, but even more equity, better distribution. The crisis we face today is best described as a dinosaur risk. Left unattended, this can be disastrous, existentially disastrous for human beings. But there is one difference between the dinosaur and us. We have the capacity for self-analysis that the dinosaur did not have. We have the ability to ask ourselves if our behavior is compatible with the new world that is emerging. I want to argue that the slow drift in technology has today reached a critical point where we need to do a major rethink of our own predicament and redesign some of the existing rules of how we human beings behave. And once again, I'm touching on the matters that both Kani and Mike said a moment ago. Fortunately, there is a precedence to where we stand today. The industrial revolution spanning roughly a hundred years from the middle of the 18th century um, uh, onwards is a representative of what happened. The world would have crashed with the industrial revolution, but fortunately we are much better off today as a result of that. It need not have been that way. The technological breakthroughs of the industrial revolution could have spelt doom. Indeed, the descriptions of the early years of industrial revolution with skies darkened by smoke and soot, laborers, including children as young as five years of age, toiling 12 to 14 hours a day, sound bleak. Profit was rising, total incomes were rising, but large segments of the population were suffering and there was widespread climate damage. We escaped this doomsday scenario for two reasons. First, 
This revolution in technology was accompanied by some of the most revolutionary changes in laws and regulations, which today look like normal laws, but they were revolutionary then. Starting with the Factories Act of 1802, we saw a set of new regulations and policies. They were considered radical and even dangerous at that time. Civilization was saved and benefited because we had the courage to carry out those radical changes. Consider the changes. There was first of all, in, from 1802 onwards, child labor was being capped. Um, from 1847, very clearly, but even before that, there were caps on the hour of, I'm very sorry, I don't even know quite how to do that, yeah. There were caps on the hour of uh, work um, uh, that was placed and in 1842, what was considered a really radical move, income tax was started in Britain and people felt that it was completely outrageous and imposition on individual rights. It seems normal to us today. The second important difference is economics as a discipline made, a, made dramatic strides in roughly the same period of the industrial revolution. From Adam Smith's Wealth of Nation in 1776 through the works of Ricardo, Mill, Marx to breakthroughs in the late 19th century, we had novel insights into the functioning of the world. We can see the benefits of this in terms of plain simple GDP growth. By the famous Angus, Deaton, um, Angus Madison's Deaton is also famous, but Angus Madison's calculation, the world's annual growth rate from 1500 to 1820 was 0.32%. In recent decades, and this is because of the Industrial Revolution, growth rate is roughly 3.2%. In short, we are now growing 10 times faster each year 10 times faster than we were before the Industrial Revolution. We are today at yet another turning point. And once again, we face a challenge of both science and policy. The basic change that has brought us to this is once again technology, this time the rise of digital science. There is now ample evidence that the share of GDP going to workers is declining in almost all advanced and higher middle income economies. The rise of artificial intelligence, robotics, and ever more sophisticated machinery is displaying labor. There's a lot of data over the last 40, 50 years. But this time we have labor being displaced, not just by capital, but labor in countries that have low wages. Thus, alongside the labor saving technology that happened during the industrial revolution, this time we have labor linking technology, digitally linked. It is possible for workers to be based in developing countries and work for a corporation in Detroit and for customers in London. This has caused a backlash against globalization, which has been heightened by the strains on the economy caused by first the Great Recession of 2008 and now the COVID-19 pandemic. And several authors have written about the possibility of de-globalization, that we will retreat from globalization. I do not think that will happen. There will be a short-term backlash against globalization, but soon thereafter, globalization will pick up. One reason is the learning by doing, old idea of Kenneth Arrow, learning by doing that has occurred during the pandemic. We all have learned to buy our daily goods using digital technology. To have lectures and classes and seminars like we are having just now using Zoom. With such a crash course in technology of outsourcing, there is bound to be an increase in the pace of globalization. Moreover, any country that puts up barriers to globalization will get outcompeted by other countries that will continue to use the cheap resource available in developing countries far away. And I personally feel that kind of globalization where global labor is brought into a common pool is worthwhile. This will cause pain and suffering. And that in turn will give rise to political conflict and turmoil. Unless we beat the challenge with out of the box reform. This is a big topic 
And all I can do is briefly record some of my preliminary suggestions I've been writing on th this topic for the last year and a half or two years. To begin with a relatively narrow matter, look at antitrust law. Beginning with the pioneering effort in the United States in the late 19th century, when the Sherman Act was enacted in 1890, antitrust laws have played a major role the world over, protecting consumers, deterring firms from some of the worst practices, and as is being emphasized now, even protecting workers because it is supposed to prevent monopsony, uh, protecting workers. But these regulations, the antitrust regulations, do not seem to be matching up to the challenge of the new digital world. The reason is a proviso that was there in the Sherman Act. Breaking up a firm into many is undesirable when the monopoly is a natural one in the sense that there are such great economies of scale that to break up the firm into several small ones is to do damage to efficiency. That is what has happened with the arrival of the digital platforms like Amazon, Alibaba, Uber, variety of them. Their advantage is the size. Buyers and sellers do not have to run from shop to shop, but can search on one platform and execute orders. But the same advantage creates the problem of disproportionate power on the part of the platform, thereby creating a policy dilemma. Antitrust laws cannot solve this problem. Our antitrust laws have helped us a lot and we must continue to use them for a host of sectors where they can be used. But it is time to recognize that the big problems of consumers and, and laborers, of them being exploited, that is accompanying the rise of digital corporations cannot be solved by these traditional laws. I'm not saying they should be ignored for a moment, but we in fact have to think of novel and newer laws and more radical laws. As we look for new policies, we have to recognize that one firm making huge profits is a problem when that huge profit goes into the pockets of a few people. That is what breeds unacceptable levels of inequality. This means that if we have to live with large corporations because of the large returns to scale being provided by the digital platforms, what we need is to turn our attention to some form of profit sharing. We have to bring in new laws that require corporations to have dispersed share of shareholdings. There will have to be severe limits to how big a share of the firm one individual can own. If the shareholding is dispersed, then even if the corporation's profit is large, this will not translate into individuals being disproportionately rich and powerful. The details of a dispersed shareholding are many, and I do not want to go into that here. This is something that I've written on, it's of interest, but what is important to recognize that the time has come for some form of profit sharing in the world. The way the time came for income tax in 1842, we have to think of novel forms of profit sharing. Let me turn to a related topic. Seeing how the last round of technological advance speeded up economic growth, there are people who worry about whether another round of fast growth is viable or even advisable. Would it not destroy the environment and prove to be ultimately unsustainable? My belief is we have little choice in the matter. Growth here on will not just be fast if we survive. We may not survive, but if we survive, will not just be fast, but I believe it will be much faster than what we have seen thus far. Just like the industrial revolution gave a fillip to growth, we will get another one. There is little we can do about this to stall the growth. There are two grounds for this hypothesis, one based on projection and on, the, uh, on reason. As already pointed out, the current global growth of 3% per annum would have been unimaginable before the industrial revolution, but we have reached that. And I feel the digital revolution, along with the linking of the world and increased globalization, will give us 
higher growth. So a substantially higher growth after some bumps, imminent bumps, is very, very likely. However, higher GDP growth does not have to mean a lower chance of long run sustainability, which is what worries lots of people. Many activists make the mistake of equating the two because they equate higher GDP growth with more cars, more jets, more houses, more carbon emission, all of which do damage to the environment. In reality, and in contrast to popular belief, the constituents of GDP as defined in mainstream economics are anything that we value. Thus, we can get higher GDP growth because we are consuming better health, longer lives. These are valued things for us that in the future, much higher growth will be inevitable if those are the forms of consumption, more music, more art, more philosophy, then we have to, the constituents of the growth will change, but the growth continues. This has to be a major part of our policy effort. If we are going to weather the more rapid growth that is bound to come with the ongoing digital revolution. Finally, a word about inequality. I have a personal advice for in influential people like many of you who are listening to this, when someone influential and powerful espouses a radical cause, such as demanding there be more equality or a forced redistribution of wealth, a standard conservative response. Also, I have to say, often comes from the extreme left. A response and criticism is, that is hypocrisy. If you are so concerned about equality, why don't you give up some of your own income first is the criticism. This criticism has had such a powerful effect on ideology and activism. Most people do not like to be hypocrites. So they are faced with a choice, either give up some of your own income and then campaign against inequality or just keep quiet. Between these two options, most people prefer the second. Hence, they keep quiet about the glaring inequality in the world. This silence about inequality is unfortunate because global inequality is reaching intolerable levels. A recent Oxfam report, you will probably know about this uh, some one or two years ago, estimates that 26 richest people on earth own the same wealth or have the same net worth as the poorest half of the world's population. That is 3.8 billion people. A back of the envelope calculation that I made shows a simple rule of three by three. Three wealthiest individuals in the world have more wealth than the entire population of three countries, A, B, and C for easy memory. Angola, Burkina Faso, and C for Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, total population of over 130 million. They have the same wealth as three individuals in the world. A certain amount of inequality as an economist I'm aware is both inevitable and important as a driver of the economy. But the level that prevails today is way beyond that. And there will come a time when we will be ashamed, our future generations will be ashamed that we tolerated this kind of an inequality. The right to dissent should by no means be restricted to the poor and those who are suffering. The conservative response that silences the well-off may at first sight look like a reasonable position to take, but it is really a non sequitur. Paul Samuelson, very interestingly reading about him, I discovered in my life philosophy takes a very, very simple, similar line. Samuelson became quite rich thanks to the phenomenal success of his textbook, but he was clear about the fact that he was ideologically progressive. And I'm quoting him. Mine is a simple ideology that favors the underdog and other things being equal, abhors inequality. At the same time, he made the point that I'm trying to make here to persuade all of you to be active in this domain. When my income this is Samuelson being quoted, when my income came to rise above the median, no guilt was attached to that. Samuelson did not feel guilty. 
but he made it clear in the essay that he would not give up his own income unilaterally, but at the same time he wrote, and I'm quoting, I have generally voted against my economic interest when questions of redistributive taxation have come up. So he did not give it up unilaterally, but voted for a system where collectively all those like Paul Samuelson would be made to give up for a better and more equitable world. And history is replete with examples of people who have taken the stance, the most prominent probably is Frederick Engels, Marx's collaborator, Karl Marx's Frederick Engels, as you probably know, was very wealthy. The, his father owned large textile factories in the greater Manchester area and elsewhere. And Engels worked not by saying that I'm going to unilaterally give up, but I'm going to try to create a better world. There were flaws in the proposal, there were flaws in the blueprint, but as an intention of a better world, it cannot be faulted. Today, hope lies in the fact that there are several among the ones who are suffering and also among the world, uh, ones who are powerful and have done well by the system, who are openly supportive of this broad progressive left-wing agenda and the objective of curbing the gross inequalities of our time. They are willing to take the conservative criticism of hypocrisy for this larger purpose. And that is what makes their cause morally powerful. I'm leaving it with this broad general appeal and the few facts and numbers I gave, but this is a big topic. I've written a lot on that. And I think we are at a juncture in the world where no one has quite the blueprint of what we want to do, but this is a time when we have to put our heads together. And I'm so glad that the organizers of this are trying to do that for a better world. And we have to be careful in creating a plan because many a past good intention, radical intention, have ended up going wrong, have ended up creating crony capitalism because you've amassed all the wealth in the hands of the government. And then a few big crony, big businesses capture that wealth. So the blueprint of what we are trying to do is important. So you need the determination, but you need also the brains and the thought that has to go behind this. And thank you very much once again for the effort. Thank you. Professor Basu, thanks so much for that uh, really rich walk through history and also just, I think, laying down some really provocative uh, ideas and setting a great tone for, uh, for this panel to now respond to. Um, so my name is Dan Vogel. I'm the North America Director for a nonprofit organization called the Center for Public Impact. We were launched by Boston Consulting Group, have a mission to reimagine government, and we're delighted, um, as Mike Froman shared earlier, to partner last year with MasterCard in publishing Built for All, a global framework for building inclusive economies, uh, which becomes the frame for, for this week's work. Um, I'd love to just invite a fantastic group of panelists that we have to uh, unpack some of the ideas that Professor Basu just laid out and also go further on topics of economic inclusion. And I'll do some very quick introductions um, so we can get to the meat of, of this important conversation. So we're, uh, Andre Dua is a senior partner at McKinsey where he leads the firm's work on inclusive economies. We'll share one of his latest publications, The Case for Inclusive Growth uh, in the Q&A. Moses Gates is the vice president of housing and neighborhood development, excuse me, neighborhood planning at the Regional Plan Association, which is the organization charged with developing and helping to implement long range regional plans for the New York tri-state metro area. And Arathni Krishnan is the Strategic Foresight Advisor at UNDP's Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific, with work focused on designing and institutionalizing system change to enable more flourishing and equitable futures for all people. Um, now, I know this is the UN, so, uh, but let's try to dispense with the formalities and make this a conversation as much as possible. So that means, for example, please don't feel like I need to call on you if you wanna chime in with, uh, with a rich insight. I also think it's easy for a conversation like this to drift into territory that's very ethereal. So the more that we can all work to be as specific and concrete as possible, how can we translate some of these ideas and intentions into action? It will make for a, a richer conversation for everybody. 
Um, so Erthi, I'd love to start with you um, because in our prior conversations, you had, uh, I thought really interestingly described yourself as someone who is inherently curious about how things work and why things don't. So you just heard a little of, of Professor Basu's um, rundown on the kind of historical and, and some of the underpinning for his interpretation of, of kind of the economy that we have today. What's your take on why our current economies don't work for more people? And what should that tell us about where uh, some solutions might lie? Thanks. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, um, everybody, for, for having us on board. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I'll jump straight into the question. Um, I think fundamentally, when we look at economic systems, it's traditionally been based on quite a narrow view of, of what humanity is capable of. You know, it's, this, it's the divide between um, a capitalist market or a socialist market, between between being cooperative or competitive. Um, and it is this narrow binary view, I think, that, that forces us into these camps of, um, of, of where we are today, where, where, where flourishing has only been relegated to uh, a small percentage of the population. And as uh, um, Kani, Michael, and, and Professor Basu said, so many of our populations have been left behind. Um, one of the fundamental failures, I believe, in, in policy sometimes is around who do we miss when we design those policies? Who, and it's not just a case about who's not in the room, because often when we design with, within our own image, even when we say equity, even when we say equality and inclusion, what that looks like to many people and what that lived experience is, isn't often brought into the space when we're designing interventions and designing for good, so to speak. So how do we better understand what policy implications are and policy impacts might be on groups within our societies, not just citizens, but everybody that exists within our societies that don't, that often get missed. So we've seen over the last year and a half through, even through COVID policies being implemented, that we implemented in, in a large scale in a lot of countries around the world, very, very mind sweeping policy changes to keep people safe. But we didn't necessarily think about how that might impact on migrant workers, on frontline workers. So people that get often missed in these conversations because as people, we have inherent bias and inherent values that underpin how we, how we design the work that we do. Um, we are also not necessarily thinking about and, and Professor Basu talked about this, and of course, you know, this has become a, a key policy driver for us here in the UN, about intergenerational impacts, trade-offs, and the shift to long-term thinking. When we are designing policy, we often think, I mean, I often think about it as, you know, what are, what are the crises in front of us that we're firefighting today? Rather than, and this isn't, a, again, it's not a binary argument, but what, within a climate of cascading crises, what are the longer term impacts of the policy decisions we make? So not just on today, but on tomorrow, and not just long term implications, but what are the future opportunities, the good things that might emerge, and what are the future risks that might emerge. And so what is the theory of opportunity that arises out of a policy being implemented, as well as a theory of harm, not just today, but down the line. Um, in terms of who, you know, where are we looking at now? And, and it's true that, so, that, that governments are increasingly, and corporations and, and institutions like the UN are increasingly looking at what do inclusive economies look like. So how do we balance growth with well-being, with equity, with, within planetary boundaries? I mean, we've seen examples in Scotland, Iceland, New Zealand that are shifting to a well-being economy that are taking into account mental health, into ability to access health services, into social uh, safety nets. Uh, we're seeing Canada, Netherlands, uh, Vietnam shifting to circular regenerative economies, which are really interesting to, to look at. Um, and one of my favorite examples is also in Costa Rica, where traditionally they've balanced uh, GDP with well-being of, of their people. So we do see examples of this go around, but there was something that uh, Professor Basu also touched on, that whenever we reimagine what flourishing looks like, I think the core failure of us, of ourselves, and this is just us as human beings, that we continue to see the centrality of 
the existing status quo within that. So we, we reimagine policies or we want to reimagine everything, but we don't really, you know, we don't really look at what is the shift of roles and shift of mandates and shift of um, objectives or outputs that we might also need to strive towards. And part of that are what are the trade-offs? If we want to generate design regenerative economies for all, what are the trade-offs that we must also look into and mitigate against or uh, gracefully exit out of? Um, I'll stop there because I really yeah. want to hear from my other panelists as well. So back to you, Dan. Thank you. Um, so Andre, build on that if you would. If you if you think about the work that you've done, and um, you know beyond the the sort of the why the case that's already been made uh, for why economic systems need to be reimagined. Erithi just cited a few examples of some uh, some places trying to do things differently. Are there are there one or two other places that come to mind for you where they are? Um, getting this right, at least to some degree, and that might offer us some some lessons or some some uh, pieces of success that, that other systems systems or society should be following. Dan, I think if it were easy to identify these one or two places, we'd all be moving there um, and participating in this great inclusive economy. Um, maybe just I might step back to talk about I think a couple things which I think will lay the groundwork for the kinds of more inclusive economies and communities you're talking about. I think the first thing that it's very, very important to talk about is the central role of growth, meaning it's very difficult to have the kind of economy we want, which is inclusive without growth. Because if we have sort of flat, um, or negative growth, what we've got is redistributive policies, um, which is about the cutting up of the pie. And we can obviously talk about the implications of that. But I think the sweet spot is for us to figure out um, methods which both continue to drive um, high, higher levels of economic growth, recognizing that there are obviously um, negatives associated with that, particularly around environmental externalities and so forth. But on the other hand, in addition to that, having um, also figuring out ways that more people participate. Um, hey, Marcella, you may, be, uh, you may just put yourself on mute. If you could, thanks. No problem. Uh, so, so I think, you know, Dan, the other side of that then is, so you have a growing economy and then you also have to figure out ways um, I think when people talk inclusive, we're talking about who gets the opportunity to participate, but I don't think any longer we can talk about it as just opportunity. We have to have some mind to, is the opportunity to participate leading to outcomes of reducing uh, reductions in income inequality? So I think that's kind of one framing thought. The second I would say um, is particularly relevant right now, because I want to get to the growth point, is the whole issue of productivity. You know, what we're sort of seeing right now, so, so obviously growth comes from two vectors, right? It's population growth and a big part of the growth in the US has been basically the entry of women and some minorities into the workforce since 1960. Um, but as labor growth has slowed, an important driver is productivity. And post COVID, we are seeing some productivity dividend from some of the things that were talked about earlier, which is digitization, automation and so forth. Um, now, there are a couple of issues with that. Right now, most of that productivity dividend is coming in what we'd call the superstar industries. Um, typically digital tech, uh, you know, technologically oriented companies. And therefore they are currently seeing 60% of the productivity growth we're seeing in the economy right now. So of course that has some issues about who are the beneficiaries of this productivity dividend. Um, and I think the other thing to think about is in order for this to generate um, a really positive 2020s, a positive decade, or, you know, some people have said the prospect of the roaring 20s, we need that productivity dividend to be broader. We also need there to be sufficient consumer demand that supports uh, the productivity growth because that will lead to overall economic growth. So uh, let me just stop there because I do think it's important to ground ourselves that it, it, I think it's better to expand the conversation from inclusive economy to inclusive mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. And I think it's better to understand what's the role of productivity in that. And I think within that context, we then need to say, 
are there on ramps and opportunities for participation? And are those opportunities demonstrably leading to better outcomes for populations who've seen their wealth stagnate? You know, for example, as we know, Black Americans have seen declines um, in wealth relative to white households. Any, anyway, I think um, yeah. perhaps let me turn it over to others. Yeah. No, I, I, I think you make you make fantastic points. And Moses, I would love to invite you in then um, because because some <laughs> What Andre is describing is a set of how do we set the table either from a policy making standpoint or a set of, uh, of kind of partnership building. It, it requires a degree of alignment across not only different parts of government, but government plus the private sector, the social sector, and a range of actors kind of pulling together in the same direction. And that coordination in practice is hard to do. I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about what, it, what does it look like for you in the tri-state area? Um, you know, what, what makes it hard and how, if you've been able to overcome some of those barriers to coordination among different actors in an ecosystem um, uh, to, to, in pursuit of inclusive growth, what, uh, what lessons might you offer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so first let me kind of introduce uh, our project and what we did here in New York City. And it's interesting because this conversation is very much in the global context. And we focus specifically on the very local context. And this let us do kind of a couple of things. The first thing it did is it let us avoid areas of division that are mainly federal or maybe state policy um, when you talk about inclusive growth. And these are the things everybody knows. This is the role of labor unions, the role of federal government and regulation, the role of taxation and minimum wage, the kind of things where you have you know, real divisions where people are not going to change their mind in a, you know, around a roundtable conversation on the appropriate roles. Um, and the local government doesn't have a lot of, of influence on many of those things. And so it let us kind of uh, look a little bit more at, at areas of consensus across this. Um, the second thing we did is we deliberately tried to get a steering committee to set policy that was, um, I would say, kind of knowledgeable and smart mid-career people. Not necessarily young people. We had kind of a range of ages. We had a range of experiences, but we made a real effort uh, to get, you know, a steering committee that was representative of New York City that had, um, you know, different life experiences, different professional experiences, and that weren't the people who are able to have these conversations around the both formal and informal tables in general. And I wanted to raise a couple of, you know, interesting things that I think are a little bit different about the approach they came up with than, than some of the other approaches. Um, and the first one is something that, um, you know, has been touched on by all three of the, the speakers so far, and that's essentially, does policy inform systems or do systems inform policy? And you know which one is the one that you are looking to change? And the steering committee focused very, very, very heavily on systems. You know, they very much believe that systems inform policy, that the key was to changing systems, to changing power relations, um, and to looking for the areas in municipal governments in which that could be affected. Um, and that's, that's a little difficult in municipal government. And that's this, that kind of ran into one of the minuses of focusing so locally is that New York State and, and New Jersey are separate states. They're always going to be separate states. They're not going to merge. They're not going to, there's not going to be a constitutional change in the United States. It's going to you know, reconfigure the, the power relations between the states, like you're working within what you're working with. Um, and you're not able to really change that. So we had to kind of like focus on the, the, the area around us. Um, and I would say that that's another thing to consider when having these discussions is, is what are the things you accept as immutable and what are the things that you don't? Um, and, you know, having that expectation early, we said we are focusing on things local government can affect within a 10 year or so time frame in a realistic manner. Having that ability lets you avoid going down a lot of rabbit holes of regovernance of, of things like that. Um, the second thing I would say is that they, they did a much deeper examination of systems and power relations than, than happens a lot of time. It wasn't just, you know, we had a big discussion on the role of local land use planning. 
And we went beyond just the relation between the city government, which is generally pro-development, and the neighborhood institutions, which are generally anti-development. And they very much went into which types of neighborhoods and why are they anti-development and what is the appropriate role therein? You know, are the richer, low-rise, low mainly white neighborhoods, maybe they should have a different kind of relationship than the denser, uh, historically disinvested neighborhoods. Um, and that's something that we, we you know, don't see often a lot is that kind of nuanced understanding and approach. The third thing is, is the language and the, uh, the language that the steering committee used was much more direct um, at, uh, than, than a lot of times you otherwise see. And the focus on race and racism and, and racial inequalities was very front and center. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of debate on the role of, of uh, you know, corporate governance, the role of uh, local institutions, you know, that kind of thing. There was a lot of different opinions. There was no dissension on the fact that racial inequality was central to what they were trying to address. Um, and that's another thing that I think was very, you know, very noticeable about the, the kind of this kind of group. And I think is something that is, is only going to grow more and more. And I would say that, you know, I would also say that that, that type of focus and that time of type of direct language did make some folks uncomfortable. Um, and, and it's the kind of thing that um, I think can, can be a real disconnect um, between different groups addressing this. Um, uh, and I, th I think that is the last kind of kind of um, lesson that I would you know that I would say happened. Um, the general and and the general focus, um, you know, didn't end up very different than a lot of other things in terms of the policy recommendations. Um, and that is kind of the the positive lesson I would take from this is you know when people have talked about the. I'll call them political divisions between people and the approaches. I don't know that the policy outcomes are that different, um, you know, in terms of the recommendations. And I and I think that there's there's winding roads to get to the same places. And being able to talk to each other and being able to navigate those difficult conversations around language and approach and systems and privilege. Um, and, uh, you know, like, like was mentioned before, the people not wanting to feel like hypocrites and, and things like that. If you can navigate those things, I, I very much believe we can get to places of consensus and, and the ability to affect real change in, in those places. Wow. No, that's, that, I think, some really rich, fantastic insights. We'll post the, um, the fourth regional plan and the includes this New York City inclusive growth plan as well in the Q and A, so folks can reference it. I also saw there was like an there was an institutional story that ran in and through that, where you were partly calling out some of the institutions that weren't working for people. And but I really appreciate your unpacking some of the human dynamics. Um, Andre, I'm going to go to you because it linked what, what uh, Moses was saying linked with something that I read in in your most recent report, where you had said uh, talking about kind of how do we get execution that ensures inclusion alongside growth in the development process. And you wrote, it'll take strong shifts in resources and capabilities, stakeholder interests and organizational incentives and trust across social networks. And I thought that sounds really hard. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> and it's layered on with the challenge that Moses is describing where folks are speaking different languages. Um, so, so maybe if you were, if you were advising um, someone with a, a sphere of influence, where do you start? You know, what are the trade-offs of an approach that's kind of more focused either at the neighborhood or city level versus a, a metro region, region or, or nation? How do you think about where to start? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think the received wisdom in the last 10 or 20 years, obviously, uh, when, when we think about economic development has really been at the metro region, metro slash region level. That's essentially the level at which we have the labor market operates, um, at which uh, agglomeration of industries and related supply chains happens. So that has been, uh, I think, the framework that people have adopted. But I think the question really 
is, and Moses, I really like what you said, which is it, it starts with a little bit reframing how you're going to tackle the problem. I mean, it, it's the asking of the problem, uh, what the problem statement is that changes all the choices that then flow from that. So it, if your problem statement is um, that we have to seek economic development, that's different than how might we create an economy in which more of our citizens have opportunities which allow them to realize their full potential in all the ways we know they're capable of without assuming that different people have different um, you know, capabilities or potential. And so, uh, so then, so once you have the problem statement, I think the other thing we're sort of seeing is, I think it's become relatively clear that the policy answers while important are perhaps not as important as the process by which the policy answers are arrived at. In other words, um, we have to shift away from let's include some additional voices and get input to let's allow more people to come to the table to participate in the decision making. Um, and that's going to lead to all sorts of different choices at the back end of the process. For example, you know, we're having this national dialogue, obviously, about infrastructure, but how you think about infrastructure, and Moses, let's take your example of New York City or the tri-state, you know, the Second Avenue subway probably wouldn't make your list of things to do to create a more inclusive economy, but creating connectivity from a transportation point of view with other boroughs who are underserved and so forth, you know, might lead you to arrive at a very different conclusion. So, I think, Dan, what I would say is it, it it's really comes down to a much more genuine procedural design about who to include, how to include them, and how not to do that in a pro forma way. But And, and that obviously is going to take then um, the building of trust, the creation of social connections, because you know, where actors will start to begin better, as we all know from a game theoretic perspective, is when they realize it's a repeat game and that we're in this together. So maybe let me just stop there. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. Um, and I also appreciate your highlighting kind of basics of human relationships and being not transactional, but actually thinking about how, how that works. So Erethi, we've got three minutes. I want to give you the last word. Um, and because both Moses and Andre have just touched on degrees of, of kind of systems change and the mindset shifts or reframes that are required uh, to give us a chance at, at having, having a go at that. So how would you describe or build on uh, the mind shifts, mindset shifts that are needed if we're to be successful in, in cultivating economies that work for all people? Thanks, Dan. I think I want, I mean, when we talk about mindset shifts, there's something that Andre just said that I really resonate with, and it's a really central part of the work that we do, which is around how can we reframe the problem statement? And reframing the problem statement is a big part of how we think about what the problem is, right? So when we are narrow, when we, again, if we make assumptions about what the issue actually is, we're not necessarily seeing the breadth and complexity ahead of us and the system in which it existed. So I'm really resonating with that. I think um, when we're talking about mindset shifts, particularly when we're thinking about long-term planning, long, you know, long-termism, future generations, how do we fundamentally shift the DNA of our institutions and our governments to take greater risks? Um, a, you know, that, that open, that the openness and curiosity of what could be if we remove the barriers that, that shackle us at the moment. Um, and what that might actually look like unleashes our imagination. And there's always controversy around the role of imagination in policymaking, um, you know, that one is too fluffy, but it actually integrates it really beautifully. If we don't have the North Star of what we could be as humanity, then how, you know, what is our roadmap for getting there? But mindset shifts don't happen. And again, I want to agree with Moses and, and, and um, Andre that the process is just as important as the final policy, but it doesn't happen from just you know, using a specific type of methodology or a specific type of tool. There is so, and there's often, like I work in foresight and often I'm asked to point to a policy change because of use of foresight. And we can't because it is an interlinkages of multiple approaches and influence and um, 
uh, understanding political shifts and ambition that make these things happen. So my final point here is it's not so much about when we want to design policies for future flourishing, for future good, it isn't just about who gets to be in the room. It's about, and it isn't just about how do we listen to multiple views, because that's quite an out of date, I would argue, uh, perspective of inclusion, but rather, how do these views actually influence decision making? Hmm. How does decision making actually change to be more anticipatory, to be more long term? How do we take the greater risk for the greater good? And how do we influence for that change to happen? And this is where we look to our leadership. This is where we look to our activists, to our young people. And this is that fundamental shift that we're not starting from a position of expertise, but rather a position of humility that, um, as, again, as Professor Basu said, we, none of us have the answer for this, but we've got to come together to redesign how we all work together um, to achieve it. I'll stop there, um, but thank you. Oh, thank you, and well said. I think um, you know our hope when we released Built for All last year was that it would it would raise the bar in the conversations around building uh, building better economies, and and I can already see that beginning today. And I'm I'm sorry that we don't have more time to go further on a few of the threads that we laid out. We will pick it up tomorrow. So I wanna thank everyone, not only our panelists for sharing your experiences and insights with us, but for the many of you who tuned in from around the world, thank you also for your questions. And I'm sorry that our team was able to answer some of them, but not all of them. We will send a follow-up with, with uh, recapping many of the questions we weren't able to get to at the conclusion of the three-day event. But would encourage everyone to join us tomorrow, 10 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we've got a really rich discussion featuring Laura Tyson, Dan Bresnitz, Marcella Escobari, and Robert Lawrence. And, and we'll go a little bit deeper around questions of equity and economic opportunity as they relate to technical innovation, industrial policy, and, and high quality jobs. So we look forward to that discussion tomorrow and wish everyone a great day. Take care.